thank you for inviting me to participate in this great uh, meeting uh, with the group of the Rotten Society, inspired by Professor Rotten and Professor Vanda Oliveira to do better operations for our patients. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for inviting us and for organizing this. It's a great honor to participate in this Brazilian Congress of Neurosurgery Update 2022. I will talk about endoscopic anatomy of the skull base, in particular, its application uh, for craniopharyngiomas and hypothalamic tumors. Following the tradition of Professor Rotten, I continue with uh, lab working and translating knowledge from the lab to the OR and trying to educate and influence the next generation of neurosurgeons to become better surgeons with the knowledge of microsurgical anatomy. You can see here some of my team members um, and fellows in the lab and some of the amazing work they are doing, which I'll share with you uh, today in this presentation. As you all know, you know, cranioforingemas are considered one of the most challenging intracranial tumors, as Cushing stated, uh, and they really are challenging tumors because of their location along the uh, pituitary stalk and hypothalamic axis. As you know, these tumors have been classified in multiple ways. Uh, one of the simplest classifications by Asteno it takes in consideration the relation to the third ventricle. Um, but in particular, uh, I'm going to focus on canoforingemas that affect the hypothalamus because those are the most challenging one. Um, and in this study by uh, Chema Pascual, you know, we have this classification on intraventricular craniopharyngiomas, which are not good for endonasal approach. These require transcranial, transventricular approaches. Uh, but then we have these three subtypes, the infundibular tuberal, that arises from the floor of the third ventricle, the secondary intraventricular that breaks the floor of the third ventricle from the supracellular system into the third ventricle, and then the pseudo interventricular, which simply displaces the third ventricle up. Um, Tuber infundibular craniopharyngiomas, those with true hypothalamic involvement, uh, were also called grade two by this uh, Zen Jose uh, paper. And uh, those are the ones that are highly complex and the risk of removing them uh, is, is significant to the point that some authors like this have recommended no attempt for gross adult resection because of the high morita to the hypothalamus. But this is before advanced endoscopic endonasal surgery and I want to show you how this has evolved and has really changed with better knowledge of the anatomy and of the surgical technique. For example, this is a case that I did about three years ago. This 15-year-old kid presented with this large uh, craniopharyngioma that you see is actually involved in the hypothalamus uh, greatly. And we have a great resection post-op with no complications, except pan hypopituitarism, of course, but other than that, excellent outcome uh, with normal cognition, no hypothalamic injury and no residual, no recurrence, no radiation three years uh, after. How is it possible to do a, a good resection such as this one? Uh, through the anatomy, through understanding really well the anatomy, and in particular, the anatomy of the floor of the ventricle, the hypothalamus uh, area is key to do a good resection in these cases. And I'm gonna share this with you today. When I look at craniopharyngiomas, I divide this in four different stages. Stage one is the uh, skull based approach. Stage two is the what we call the cisternal or vascular microsurgery. Stage three, hypothalamic supial dissection technique, which I'll show you, and then finally the reconstruction. For the skull based approach, uh, it is very important to understand the concept of the medial optic carotid recess. Um, and particularly, we need to really do a wide exposure that involves removal of all the bone that you see here around the optic canal, beginning of the optic canal and paracranial ICA. My reference for this exposure is the optic, optic strut. I remove the bone all the way here. So I really have good exposure of optic nerve and carotid. So when I open the dura towards the distal ring and towards the falcifer ligament, as I'll show you, I can actually see the optic nerve and the carotid artery with uh, the hypophyseal branches early on the operation. So I have no obstruction here. This is a very important uh, concept. At the same time, our exposure is very wide but it's short. It doesn't need to be very tall exposure. We use the limbus of the sphenoid as our landmark. You see the limbus of the sphenoid is dural fold right here, which you can see in surgery uh, always. And you can see in the dissections here, this dural fold extends towards the uh, roof of the optic canal, actually continues with 
or as the falciform ligament. And that is the limit of exposure for the majority of conopharyngiomas as they grow posterior and superiorly towards the third ventricle and not anterior towards the anterior skull base. So they stay in the central, central skull base towards the third ventricle. That's why the limbus is our limit. Um, invariably, or a corridor, surgical corridor for conopharyngiomas working endonasally is always between the optic apparatus and the pituitary gland. And uh, that's why it's very important to really drill the cell up very well so I can gently displace the pituitary gland inferiorly. This allows me to find the pituitary stock early in the case so I can try to preserve it and follow uh, the tumor attachment uh, or origin. And two, because give me increased exposure uh, to get into the hypothalamic region from this corridor. So we don't manipulate the optic nerve, we manipulate the pituitary gland. In occasions, the pituitary gland has to be manipulated much more than just inferior displacement. It has to be transposed or even resected, as I'll show you. Um, pituitary transposition techniques have been described, and we use the trans, uh, the inter, the transcavernous or interdural approach here, mostly for chordomas, uh, chondosarcomas, meningiomas. But of course, for craniopharyngiomas, we use the intradural uh, transposition technique. And it can be on one side, hemitransposition. It can be on both sides, full transposition. When we do this, especially when it's a full transposition, there is a high risk of pituitary dysfunction to the point that when I think there is very low chance of preserving the pituitary gland function um, or the integrity of the stock with resection, I might consider removing the pituitary gland entirely, as I'll show you in some cases. And this adds uh, benefits as better exposure of the retrocellular space and to the into the hypothalamic uh, region. Key understanding is when we go to the next stage, we finish our exposure, um, is understanding of the system of anatomy. And in this case, the microvascular anatomy, anatomy of the superior hypophysial arteries first. Um, we describe these and we have different branches. We have a main stem that gives this uh, uh, Infundibulo chasmatic branch, which is an astomoly with the contralateral side. There is branch, this large branch going to the optic nerve or recurrent artery to the optic nerve. But then there's this descending branch uh, that usually goes to the diaphragm or to the upper aspect of the pituitary gland. And often we can sacrifice this branch, or we have to, because it's the one that is giving vascular supply to the tumor. And in addition, as you will see, as we cut this artery, we can actually displace the main stem of the superior abovisual artery and preserve it, preserve the vascular supply to the optic nerve and to the pituitary stock as needed. This, the details of the variation of this anatomy have been described in this paper, um, but basically the most common configuration is this uh, trifurcation, uh, although sometimes this descending branch is, it is absent. Also remember there are uh, what we call secondary or posterior superior abovisual arteries, other branches that come directly from the correct artery but more posteriorly, after the uh, main superior hypophysial artery. All those perforating branches from the correct artery need to be identified and preserved uh, to the best of our abilities during these craniofarnyoma resections. Once we pass that first layer on the uh, superior hypophysial artery, go more posterior into the retrochasmatic space, a space that is full of very relevant anatomy. You see, this is the first area where the superior hypophysial arteries are located and the stock. We go retrochasmatic. And then we have all the secondary branches to the from the carotid artery. And of course, we've had the PCOM, posterior communicating artery, which forms the lateral aspect of the uh, uh, exposure. And very often, we need to be very careful with the relationship of the tumor capsule with the PCOM and dissect it off the capsule. And finally, following all the way to the posterior civil arteries and the basilar bifurcation. Here is an endonasal view from the front of this very key anatomy that we are going to be exposing when we do, do craniofarnyoma surgery. That's, that's the reason why this is such delicate operation. The vascular anatomy that is involved is, uh, you know, really very relevant, as you see here. And third, third stage, such an important stage that requires significant learning curve uh, to do accurate and safe resections in these areas, uh, is the what we call the hypothalamic supial dissection technique. And if you look at the area of the uh, hypothalamus and optic chasm, they share a same PL membrane. But if you dissect superiorly the chasm and the uh, hypothalamus, they have different planes of dissection. 
you can actually separate one from the other. And this is what we do in, op in the operation. We want to find this supial plane of dissection between optic chasm and um, hypothalamus and tumor. And uh, we're going to learn now some of these key lamas we, we are uh, uh, describing. Uh, so we've been studying, again, this anatomy of the hypothalamus in the laboratory. You can see this uh, beautiful dissections from the ventral aspect through an endonasal approach. You know, the hypothalamus has this triangular shape, but you see it here. And there are two key landmarks that we need to remember. One is the optic chasm in the front. Two is the mammary body in the back. If we look at it from the uh, front view, again, optic chasm on the front and lateral, and then mammary bodies posteriorly. Those are the boundaries of the hypothalamic region. We do follow the dissection. These are dissections performed by Max uh, Nunez in my lab. Beautiful dissections of the hypothalamic region. You see, this is the mammary body here. This is hypothalamic uh, tissue. This is after removing the uh, uh, optic chasm. We can see this nuclei of the hypothalamus. We can see the phone is going down to the mammary body. We can see lateral hypothalamus. So I asked Max to help us understand better the anatomy of the hypothalamus and the different nuclei, because this is key to understand uh, our dissection planes when we deal with cuneiformiomas. And you, as you know, there are tumors where uh, if they are purely intraventricular, we do not want to do these tumors endonasally, basically because the floor of the ventricle is still going to be intact. Um, but those that are basically tubular infundibular, they have hypothalamic tissue around them. And we need to identify what hypothalamic tissue we have around us and how to dissect it safely. In this case, ventromedial nucleus, as you see here, is going to be at risk, but the arcuit is the one that is going to be destroyed by tumor. I'm going to take advantage of that when we access the uh, area through the endonasal approach. So looking at this uh, dissection, this uh, reflects different nuclei of the hypothalamus. Uh, but we describe two key landmarks here, uh, the retrocosmatic sulcus and the pre sulcus. And these are the two areas of dissection I'm going to use to preserve the key areas of hypothalamic tissue of anterior hypothalamus, which is anterior to the retrocosmatic sulcus, and posterior hypothalamus, which is posterior to the pre sulcus. So I, if I stay within these two lines, I'm going to access the infundibular or arcuate nuclei um, that is the one that controls pituitary function and therefore is the one that I can, um, I can uh, injure during the operation because these tumors over there are causing pituitary dysfunction very often. So you look at this anatomy, this is the tubular uh, nuclei that we are uh, exposing. You know, this is the uh, retrocosmatic line. In front of it, we have the anterior hypothalamus that we need to be very careful to preserve as tumors get into this anterior hypothalamus, supracosmatic recess, anterior commissure. We are dealing with you know, risks of temporary dysregulation, hyperperexia, for example, can be a very significant side effect uh, post-operatively. And then posterior to this line, the uh, retrocasmatic line, we have the posterior hypothalamus, of course, with the mammillary circuit uh, involved in memory and cognition, but also importantly, uh, uh, areas that control hunger. And uh, as we also work superiorly, we get to the ventromedial and dorsomedial nuclei, that control also society and they are involved in hypothalamic obesity. So areas to be extremely careful about. If we look at this from this anterior perspective, the uh, retrocosmatic line defines the limit of anterior hypothalamus that we need to preserve. The uh, pre line defines the limit of posterior hypothalamus we need to preserve. These are infundibular arcuate nuclei. But also as we go deep, we find this deep nuclei just above the arcuate nuclei. And these are, again, the ventrolateral dorsal medial that we need really need to preserve in our dissections because they are related to a hypothalamic uh, obesity. Uh, so this is our infundibular arcuate right in here. And these are anterior nuclei in this area that we cannot afford injuring all these areas. And then these are the area of the ventral medial dorsal lateral that we need, need, to, need to preserve too as we get deeper uh, through the uh, floor of the third uh, ventricle. As we uh, see in this dissection, we can see in red, we have the arcuate nuclei right by the mammillary body. Then we have the 
green and in red. These are, uh, again, ventromedial and dorsolateral nuclei. Above the arcuate that we need to preserve, in blue, we have the posterior nuclei. And those should not be, so, I'm sorry, the lateral nuclei. Those should not be uh, an issue in our dissection. Again, a more uh, view from below, from inferior to superior, to access the area of the uh, hypothalamic uh, region. A lot of complex anatomy, but uh, for me, it's important to understand the nuclei that are at risk. I know that I'm going from below between the uh, optic chasm and the mammary bodies. I can access relatively safely this area. As I go uh, deeper, I need to be careful to avoid injuring the deeper uh, nuclei in those areas. A few examples that I'm going to show you here. This is a 53-year-old female patient with severe cognitive decline uh, presents um, and this large partially cystic uh, lesion clearly involving the fourth the third ventricle. In a case like this, I believe this is a tuberin infundibular tumor, um, but it could be intraventricular because I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do in this case. Is I'm going to do a first and uh, transfrontal approach, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which allows me to uh, decompress the cyst, confirm the diagnosis, and then as I do that, uh, the cyst collapses nicely and confirms that this uh, is hypothalamic tissue laterally, and this is a tumor that is breaking through the floor of the third ventricle, so I can access this endonasally. And this is what I did in this case. Uh, this patient had uh, partial uh, hypopituitarism, uh, but I decided that it was impossible for me to remove this tumor entirely without removing the pituitary gland. This is the pituitary gland being removed right here. Uh, this, of course, is discussed with the patient. Um, and then we access the hypothalamus right here. Without taking the gland, I would not have access. This is the dorsum cella dura that I've opened. Here I'm uh, looking at my landmarks, including the optic chasm anteriorly, the mammary bodies posteriorly. And I know this is the cyst membrane uh, and it's going to be attached to very important nuclei of the hypothalamus, um, dorsal and uh, ventral. And then I'm dissecting in the retrochasmatic uh, uh, area. And this is infundibular right here, an arcuate, and the floor of the third ventricle, just in front of the mammary bodies here <clears throat> that I use as a landmark. And thankfully, there is a good uh, separation between the tumor capsule and the hypothalamus at this area. Again, looking superior into the hypothalamic region, you can see uh, with ICG visualization, uh, the hypothalamus bilaterally nicely preserved. You can see the indentation that the tumor caused, but we've been able to perform a good accurate resection of this tumor. And you see this patient has intact hypothalamus. Uh, uh, of course, you needed full pituitary replacement, but excellent recovery of cognition and uh, 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 no hypothalamic uh, complications. Some of these tumors can become extremely challenging, like uh, this one, um, you know, really large uh, craniopharyngioma. This patient presented with um, decreased level of consciousness, uh, obstructed hydrocephalus that we treated with uh, external ventricular drains. Both ventricles were trapped. And uh, this very large uh, tumor uh, was all um, approached endonasally. And it's because if you work within the tumor and you know how to expose it and bring the cyst walls uh, uh, down, you can remove all this endonasally. So the exposure, however, is similar. You, the cell is expanded. You see the limbus of the sphenoid still is there. Um, that's my dural opening all the way to the limbus of the sphenoid. I uh, identify those branches going to the tumor capsule so I can preserve the main stem of the superior hypophysial artery, as you see superiorly. Right here, the superior hypophysial artery has been preserved. And then I found the pituitary stalk. You see how the gland is nicely. The whole floor has been removed. I debulk the tumor. And I, again, preserve the super hypophysial artery branches. This is my cisternal stage of the operation. Again, I'm dissecting, sorry about that, dissecting the super hypophysial artery branches and doing the bulking of the tumor. Again, the main stem is being preserved right there. These are secondary uh, hypophysial artery branches that I am preserving, or posterior superhypophysial branches, that again, from the core unit to preserve. And now this is the key plane on the uh, hypothalamic interface. I see the uh, optic chasm superior, retrochasmatic space. I see the mammary bodies. I go in front, pre-mammary sulcus. I find my superior plane of dissection. I'm still at the level of the arcuate infundibular nuclei. Uh, and therefore, I, I use my sharp dissection in these areas. 
and then superiorly, the tumor could be attached to the ventral and dorsal nuclei, and I have to be very careful with that dissection to prevent hypothalamic injury, as you see right here. This is in the retrochasmatic uh, line, dissecting the tumor, and we obtain what it seems to be a complete tumor resection. You see those microcalcifications that you left intact in there, um, but this patient had an excellent outcome and he's already now two years out of uh, uh, surgery with uh, an MRI that shows no residual tumor. Um, and this patient is actually back to work. Uh, he works in, in uh, computer science and uh, he's had an excellent outcome. Full pituitary replacement in spite of preservation of the stock, but, uh, but excellent, excellent resection. In children, we also have to deal with you know, really complex tumors like this one. Um, this uh, kid with very large, multiply cystic, partially calcified tumor with brainstem compression, as you see here, had had previous attempts at the cyst fenestration. And in this case, I had to do a combination with transclival approach. And this is a case where I will do a full pituitary transposition, you know, because I need to get access posteriorly. You can see that's the uh, basilar bifurcation and basilar trunk being dissected. This is the third nerve laterally. Uh, towards the uncus right here. And now this is my uh, planar dissection with the uh, hypothalamic uh, region. Again, retrochasmatic space. I'm still at the level of the infundibular nuclei. Um, edematous uh, uh, hypothalamus, but it's still intact. And that was the pituitary gland displaced laterally. This patient is more than three years of uh, surgery with no residual, no recurrence. Uh, full pituitary replacement in spite of preservation of the pituitary gland uh, that was transposed, but it's still a uh, pituitary gland was uh, um, function is not preserved, uh, but excellent outcome otherwise. And it's not all about chronophoringiomas. You know, sometimes we have tumors in this area that are uh, uh, involved in the hypothalamus. This 16-year-old patient uh, presented with this combined, uh, you know, cellar, supracellular region and pineal region tumor. Um, of course, this was initially treated with chemotherapy with a, a relatively good response, but had some residual tumor still in the hypothalamus that would not go away. And it happened the same with the pineal mass and it came as mature teratoma. So we decided to perform surgery for this case. Look how close is the space within the optic apparatus and the pituitary gland. Uh, the dorsum cell is in my way to get to the hypothalamus. I'm going to actually remove the pituitary gland in this case. Why? Because this patient has no pituitary function. There is no chance he's going to recover it. And uh, the only way to really get good access to that area is through the um, uh, pituitary transposition technique. In this case, again, not pituitary transposition, but pituitary transection. So we very gently dissect the pituitary gland out of the walls of the cella. Again, this, this is done in an intradural fashion. Um, and you can remove the, the gland, coagulate and cut the stalk. That's the gland being removed. After that, I can dissect the dura of the dorsum cella. And then I can drill the dorsum cella and uh, bite the dorsum cella, split it in two, then remove the, the posterior clinoids, one on each side. Um, that is moving the uh, left posterior clinoid, and this is the right posterior clinoid. You can see how this has greatly increased our access to the supracellular uh, retrogasmatic space where the tumor is located. Um, you see the basilar bifurcation, really a difficult access uh, area. Mammillary bodies are my key reference again. Again, retrochasmatic sulcus. You see, I find out my plane of dissection right there. I know those are the safe areas for me to start accessing the hypothalamic region. Again, infundibular nucleus is what I'm going to be accessing right there. As long as I don't go above the level of the optic chasm, as we said, we're safe for the dorsal and uh, ventral nuclei. And very careful dissection allows me to uh, dissect all the tumor completely. Posteriorly, I find the mammillary bodies, my posterior reference for the posterior hypothalamus. And this tumor is uh, entirely uh, removed with no manipulation of the optic apparatus. You see the inside of the third ventricle, and then we proceed with our uh, reconstruction. Um, and this is the post-operative view of this patient. Um, so in conclusion, craniofonin surgery requires the combination of skull-based neurovascular and brain surgery expertise. Uh, the endonasal approach provides an ideal corridor even for the most complex conophorangiomas. It has a unique view of this dissection plane of the chasm and hypothalamus.
And we have reviewed here key historical nuances of the different stages of the approach. And again, uh, understand the hypothalamic clonal dissection remains a very important aspect of this operation. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention.